Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chelsea Lyons, and I am the North Carolina State Field Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force. We are a united group of 1.5 million parents dedicated to protecting children's health by addressing climate change, public health, and environmental justice. Today, we have come together to discuss the topic of air monitoring, what it is, its importance, and why it is relevant to North Carolina. On November 3rd of 2022, the EPA announced a $53.4 million in grant awards for 132 community air pollution monitoring projects in 37 states, including North Carolina. Funded by the Inflation Reduction Act and the American Rescue Plan, these projects are focused on communities that have been historically marginalized and overburdened by, po by pollution, supporting President Biden's Justice 40 initiative. The funding is meant to improve ambient air quality monitoring among communities to collect new data on air pollution to address polluted areas. Luckily for us, three organizations in North Carolina were granted awards, Clean Air NC, RTI International, and the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. Joining me today are representatives from two of the three awarded organizations, Executive Director Jeffrey Robbins from Clean Air NC, an organization devoted to ensuring that everyone has clean air and a livable climate, Director of Environmental Health and Water Quality, Jennifer Redmond at RTI International, an independent nonprofit research institute dedicated to improving the human condition. And lastly, research chemist, Dr. Lee Han from RTI International. Lee will be the PI for the new funded EPA grant enhanced air quality monitoring for underserved child care facilities in North Carolina. I wanted to thank you all for coming to join us today and let's get started. I would like to start with Dr. Lee Han to discuss the importance of air monitoring and how air pollution impacts our health. Dr. Lee, you may share your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay. Make sure everyone can see my screen. Well, thank you very much, Chelsea, for the um, introduction and for the opportunity talking about our newly awarded EPA Air Monitoring Grant. So I'm joined by my colleague, Jennifer Redman at RTI, to talk about why we monitor air quality in childcare facilities, how we do it, and what we would like to achieve in the next three years during the, the project. So we have a diverse and multidisciplinary team for the proposed work. That's including air quality chemistry from analytical science department at RTI, children's environmental health and environmental justice researchers at environmental health and water quality research department at RTI. And also we collaborate with Dr. John Banks group at NCCU for field deployment and outreach to underserved black communities. The overall of the EPA objective for this competitive grant is to enable the communities to monitor their air quality and promote monitoring partnerships. So at RTI, we have uh, three specific objectives um, to achieve what EPA is looking for. So number one, first, we will characterize ambient air quality and the potential exposure disparities in the underserved areas, particularly among childcare facilities. The second, we will build um, enhanced ambient air quality monitoring capabilities in these areas. Lastly, at the end of the project, we aim to empower childcare facilities the staff members there, the families, and the local decision makers to better understand the local ambient air qualities and to take steps to mitigate harmful exposures. So why we do this? We all know air pollution such as PM 2.5, particular matters, ozone and their precursor gases can have negative health effect on human health and increase the risk of respiratory infection, heart diseases, and lung cancer. So children are particularly susceptible susceptible to this adverse health effect is mainly because their ongoing lung development and the neurological development. They are more likely to develop asthma and allergies and have increased the risk of cancer and cardiovascular diseases later on in their life. PM 2.5, um, ozone and their precursors are primarily found in the areas um, such as near railroad highways, like road, road, roadways, industrial facilities, gas stations, and auto shop, et cetera. So child care facilities in underserved communities are often located in these type of areas because of less premium real estate cost. Thus, it's very important to characterize the, the nature of extended exposure of these air pollutants and identify the potential inequities in exposure for children in the underserved communities. 
So in this study, we will use child care center as our research settings because many children spend, majority of children spend the majority of their early years in child care centers outside their home. So in North Carolina, more than a quarter of million children are enrolled at over 4,400 licensed child care facilities. So in this project, we will build on the established partnership between RTI and the child care facilities that is recruited as a part of the RTI's EPA center grant. And Jennifer is leading for the center enrollment for this project. At the end of the project, we aim to provide um, actionable fundings, which will allow children to engage in outdoor activities safely and equitably while in child care settings. So how we are going to do it? Uh, in this study, we'll monitor PM 2.5, particular matter, ozone, and their precursor gases, including nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and sulfur dioxide at the 20 child care settings for eight consecutive seasons. We will collect real-time continuous PM 2.5 measurement data and the time-weighted average for, for those gases of pollutants, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and ozone concentrations to understand the spatial and temporal distribution of air pollution experienced by young children in the study area. Um, for the, the, the gases pollutant, we're going to use Oganda, Ogawa possible samplers to collect measurement data. The data will be collected for two weeks, 14 days, seasonally, summer, fall, winter, and spring, and four sampling events each year will be conducted over two years. And we propose to start the, the, the study in the summer of 2023. Um, for, for the particular measure, particular matter measurement, we're going to use a solar powered purple air sensors uh, to monitor the PM 2.5 in real time for two year study duration. They are established the purple air monitoring network that we can combine our monitoring results to get a better understanding of the overall exposure in that area. At the end of the project, with EPA's approval, we will uh, donate the, uh, the poppy air sensors to the enrolled child care facilities at the end of the project and to continue the air quality monitoring at the facilities. We, we actively work with other researchers and the community partners for the proposed project. We partner with uh, Professor John Van at North Carolina Central U University Dr. Ben is an expert in air pollution and health disparities, and he will work on the, the field deployment of monitors and possible samplers and facility the outreach to the underserved Black communities. So from here, I will hand the presentation over to my colleague, Jennifer, who will talk about our other community partners we will work with and the selection and enrollment criteria of the child care centers. Thank you, Jennifer. Great, thanks so much, Lee. So we are working with community advisors to make sure that we execute this grant well. And our two community advisors include the NC Choose Safe Places Advisory Group, which is made up of individuals that work at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, um, advisors external to the state agency, and it's supported by the CDC. And the goal of that program is to help ensure that child care centers are sited in areas that are environmentally safe and healthy for children. The second advisor that we have is within the Children's Environmental Health Unit at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and making sure that we work with the state along with the licensed child care centers throughout the program and also share our results. Um, we plan to, as Lee noted, recruit and enroll 20 child care facilities that are located in underserved communities across central North Carolina, and I'll share that with a map in a bit. And the project also is leveraging our EPA Center grant, as Lee noted, and that grant is called the Preschool Environmental Experiences and Development Study. And you can click on that QR code if you're interested for more information on that grant, or if you have a child in a child care center in Central North Carolina or are a teacher or administrator and potentially interested in that grant as well. And that grant is focused on also environmental monitoring along with children's health and how our child's environment both at the child care center and at home affects their cognitive and behavioral development. So for child care center selection, we are focused on areas that have disproportionate air quality exposures that we surmise 
based on available data and also serve a majority low income or minority population. So we're basically looking at two criteria, one geographic and two socio-demographic. And I'll go into that a bit more. So for the geographic criteria, we are looking at centers that are within um, areas with census block groups that are characterized over 80th percentile for PM 2.5. So that's small particulate matter, and that's based on the Environmental Protection Agency's environmental justice screening tool, or also areas that are in an economically distressed opportunity zone as defined by the United States Housing and Urban Development. The second criterion we're looking at is for socio-demographics of the children within these centers and children that are um, centers that have more than 50% children of color and or 50% children receiving free or reduced lunch based on family income level would fall within this socio-demographic criterion. So when we look at all that, we put together, this is a map if you're watching and you can see this online. And so we have a 10 county area within Central North Carolina that we're focused on. And so it includes the triangle, which is often known as Wake, Durham and Orange counties, but also some of the counties surrounding the triangle. And within those counties, there's just over 900 licensed childcare facilities. And you can see with the areas that are hatched that those are classified as those opportunity zones by the Housing and Urban Development Agency. And then the areas that have orange or red shading on them are areas that are known to have increased particulate matter based on EPA's EJ screen tool. So we overlaid these along with all of the dots you see every one of those dots is a child care center. And so there's a lot of child care centers in the urban areas of Durham and Wake County, especially, but you see that they are dispersed across the 10 county area. And some of them are in more rural areas, but those rural areas in some cases might fall close to roadways or gas stations or other things that can create exposures as Lee noted. So what we'll be doing is working with our community partners and the child care facilities to institute the grant activities as Lee listed. And then importantly, taking the findings that we have on the air quality monitoring to number one, disseminate results to centers in an easy to understand way so they can see what their monitoring results are looking like, we also will be sharing that to stakeholders overall on our project website. The Purple Air website, anybody that uses a Purple Air sensor that automatically goes onto their public mapper and is available. And then we'll be hosting webinars as well at RTI and with our university partner. The second thing that we'll be doing to help showcase this work is developing educational materials that really help to translate these findings and interpret what it means when there's air quality exposures and how those can change over time. And that might include videos along with print and digital flyers. So overall, our expected project outputs are these individual reports to childcare centers of the air quality results. And it would show the results along with potential health risks, but also recommendations on ways to minimize exposure for children in your care. Um, summary reports for the community, policymakers, and county and state governmental agencies, along with peer reviewed publications and public results sharing, and then hosting and recording these public webinars, such as the one today. Overall, our outcomes, so we have these specific outputs and our outcomes we're hoping to make changes on are increased community awareness of air pollution, including the long-term adverse health effects in children and identifying areas where there are more problems within central North Carolina, how we can provide increased access to air quality exposure risks, um, understanding those uh, risks through information and tools, more informed state policymaking and a promotion of long-term community actions. And then lastly, long-term reductions in children's exposure to air pollution, including particulate matter and ozone. 
So I'll briefly just show here is an example of a purple air mapper online. This is a screenshot. And so this was just taken about an hour and a half ago uh, in the triangle. And so our goal is for child care centers to be able to go onto the purple air mapper and have their sensor on site and see what it shows, what it means for them and whether or not there should be changes to what they're doing with their children at that time. And so you can see right now, there's a lot in the yellow range and the yellow range is showing that air quality is acceptable. However, there may be a risk to some people within 24 hours of exposure, particularly those who are unusually sensitive to pollution. Um, and then as you scroll out regionally, here's the regional PM 2.5. And you can see there's, there's more colors, right? There's some areas that are green, which are denoted as better air quality. Some areas are red, which are noted as worse air quality. And then Purple Air also has graphs. So if you check on any individual air sensor, you can see how it's averaged over the last few days. And so that's interesting as well. And our goal would be that anybody participating in our study would be able to understand what that means. Wonderful. Thank you, Lee and Jennifer, for talking about that. <clears throat> now, just a quick... Uh, Question for you, Jennifer. So in order for us to, is the purple air monitoring system or graphics, are those available online for everyone in the public? They are. So if you go to this link here um, or type in purple air to Google, you can go on and you can play with it and you can scroll in and out wherever you are and where you live. Perfect, thank you so much. I would now like to turn it turn our focus over to Jeffrey Robbins from Clean Air and Sea. Jeffrey, can you go ahead and walk us through your presentation you've created for us today? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. I thought what we do is kind of go over who we are, why we do monitoring, uh, talk a little bit about the project and description and community engagement, as well as the modern training and collection of information. Oops. So we are Clean Air NC. Our mission is to advocate for the health of all- One moment, North Jeffrey, sorry. Uh, your screen is showing, um, it is not showing your screen at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Not showing your presentation. Apologies for that. There you go, thank you. Be better, okay. Thank you. Uh, so we advocate for the health of all North Carolinians by pursuing equitable and collaborative solutions uh, that address climate change and air pollution. Our vision is where a stable climate and clean air create healthier lives for all. So what does that all mean? Um, it, it's manifested in our five programs that work to ensure that people have clean air to breathe and a stable climate to thrive in. So we activate hundreds of community advocates each year to promote clean energy and clean transportation in North Carolina. We've created the first statewide air quality monitoring network. We've created a statewide network of health professionals leading, leading the call for clean air and climate health. We host North Carolina's annual premier climate and health conference, NC Breathe and State of Climate, which soon will be renamed. And we empower Charlotte's historic West End to create the first green district in North Carolina. So just a little bit about us. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, and you've heard a little bit about this from my colleagues from RTI, um, but why do we monitor and why is it important? So particulate matter, they're actual particles. They can be solid or liquid, uh, conglomerates of different chemicals often referred to as a toxic cocktail, meaning no particle is the same. A typical fine particle can include hazardous heavy metals, air toxics, and various types of carbon. Sources include fossil fuel combustion, dust from agriculture and construction, uh, burning of wood and other waste, as well as agricultural animal, animal waste, and then wear from roads, tires, and brakes. So when it comes to particulate matter or to PM, size does matter. Um, as you heard a little bit about it a second ago, the size of PMs that we're most concerned about are PM 2.5 which means 2.5 microns in di diameter or smaller. 
And we know that the lungs cannot remove these invisible fine particles through normal processes like coughing. So that's why it's important that we monitor this because it ultimately can lead to other issues um, relative to uh, different types of cancer, um, as well as um, other issues that cause health impacts. So our grant objectives and plans um, for what we're going to be doing in Sampson County, which is in Southeast North Carolina, is to establish an air monitoring network there. Uh, we hope to address longstanding health inequities and environmental justice implications to understand cumulative air pollution impacts of what's happening in Sampson County. From tr non-traditional sources, and what I mean by that is in the pictures you'll see uh, what's known as concentrated animal feed operations or CAFOs, uh, wood pellet facilities, as well as landfill operations. In addition to polluting ground and surface water, CAFOs also contribute to reduction of air quality in areas surrounding industrial farms. Animal feeding operations produce several types of air emissions that we'll be monitoring, including gases and particular substances. And CAFOs produce even more emissions due to their size than a lot of other things. So we measure particulate matter less than or equal to 2.5 microns in aerodynamic diameter. Uh, we're going to be measuring volatile organic compounds, speciated VOCs, as well as, as, well as hydrogen sulfide, uh, H, H2S emissions uh, using purple air, H2S monitoring equipment, and what's known as a VOC dark car. We'll be collaborating with EJ Can, which is located in Sampson County. RTI, our partners that are also sharing this call, will be partnering with UNC Chapel Hill Institute for Environmental Health Solutions as well as UNC Charlotte and Sampson County community members. Oops, sorry. So the map below uh, that you see uh, combines population characteristics and air pollution burden indicators to provide sort of a thematic visual of environmental injustice by block group within Sampson County. The population characteristics chosen are a combination of socioeconomic indicators of sensitive populations that together reflect the population vulnerability to pollutions. The pollution burden indicators are a combination of direct exposure and the presence of industrial operations which are present in the community. Together, these indicators help describe and, describe and visualize the disproportionate impact that environmental pollution has on Sampson County residents. So uh, this project truly follows what we are establishing as an organization to partner with communities to listen and learn about what's going on in their community, collect the data, perform the analysis, and provide reporting. We'll then step in as an organization to educate and advocate for clean air through partnering with other organizations, agencies to advocate for policy and rules change, primarily in the form of permits. The other offshoot that we'll be using or, or, or taking this information and, and disseminating is through our EJ dashboard, which was part of a different grant. But that grant will also provide a dashboard for EJ communities to be able to go out and understand what's happening in our community, much like um, what the folks from RTI talked about, um, where they'll be able to then understand exactly what's happening specifically in their area. So that's, uh, that's it. Well, thank you, Jeff, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. So mm -hmm. where, what do you think we will be doing with this air monitoring data? What do you think the next step is after we have all of our systems put in and we have the first year of data? So the first year of data, obviously for us, our, our grant is a three-year grant. And so um, as we're collecting the information, we'll be um, obviously sharing that information with community members, but more importantly, doing the data analysis and interpretation of that information. So it's a cross-section over a long period of time to be able to understand the variations that may happen in the data. Um, understand and take into consideration climate, temperature, humidity, and those types of factors. Absolutely. And why are air quality issues an environmental justice issue? Um, well, I think uh, air quality 
issues in general, um, you know, are important because most of the areas that are impacted are in low income um, areas that are um, historically um, black indigenous people of color that have been marginalized and underserved for years. And so um, those are the folks that are most vulnerable and are have the highest rates of exposure and health impact. So the monitoring of those areas to understand what's happening and then be able to talk about the cumulative impacts and then ultimately, um, you know, work with through the process of advocacy and education to really make change. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, I just want to thank you guys, Jeff, Jennifer, and Lee for joining us today. And I want to thank our partners, RDI, RTI International and Clean Air NC for being a part of this wonderful educational webinar. I will now open it up to questions from the press or participants if we have any. We'll give it a few moments. Hey, it seems we don't have any questions at this time. Um, you guys want to wait, wait a few minutes, see if we get anybody? Ooh. Yeah. Okay. We'll hope for the best. Um, I want to thank you guys really a lot for meeting with us today and talking about this really big discussion. I know that is kind of in the beginning stages of air monitoring systems, but we do appreciate you. Moms appreciates you and all your guys' work. So thank you. Thank you. Really nice that you're able to help highlight these issues. Yeah, this is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we are going to call it a day. We are not getting anything on our end. So I appreciate you guys and I hope you have a good rest of your day. You thank too. You. Okay, thank you. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.